Well, let's take you back to Ukraine now. And the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, has paid a surprise visit to Kiev. It comes at a crucial time in the war effort against Russia, which has opened up a new front in the northeast with reports of a possible major offensive on the horizon. We're joined now by our security and defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. And, and Michael, we saw the, those shots of Antony Blinken enjoying a working lunch in Kiev just a short while ago. What significance would you attach to this surprise visit he, he's made to Ukraine? Yes, Jane. I mean, I think the key word is surprise. Nobody thought he was going to do this because he's been involved in the Middle East uh, very intensively. And in public, they said what you'd expect them to say. They both said, they use this word challenging. It's a very challenging time for Ukraine. So he's there to offer support. He's there to talk about the importance of the aid package, which the Americans have now granted. That's what they say in public. He doesn't need to do that face to face. In private, what I suspect they're talking about will be the restructuring of the government, which Zelensky is working on. And there's a lot of controversy in Kiev at the moment. Zelensky is under pressure and the Americans have views about the way the government might be restructured to make it more efficient, to actually uh, combat corruption more efficiently, which affects all of these governments. And they also have views on the rules of engagement. The Ukrainians have been pushing the rules of engagement to attack Russia directly, not using Western weapons, but attacking Russia directly and attacking oil refineries in Russia. The Americans don't like that because it raises the price of petroleum and so on. So I think Blinken will be expressing the Americans' view about some of the internal issues which Zelensky has got to deal with over this critical summer. That's why I think they're talking face to face. Now, of course, there's this US aid package which the Secretary of State says has already arrived in Ukraine. What are the main arms that the country needs to, to push back against Russia? Well, they, they need more of everything. Um, and they need more artillery, uh, more tank rounds, more small arms ammunition. But if you ask Zelensky, and he said this in a couple of interviews, what is the one thing he most needs is better air defence. I mean, this time last year, um, they were intercepting about 90% of all the drones and missiles that were thrown at them. Now they're intercepting sometimes less than 30%. And so the, the drones and missiles are doing a lot of damage, both to the front line and to Ukrainian cities. And they need all sorts of air defence. But the thing they most want, and Zelensky has mentioned this very explicitly now, Patriot air defence batteries. They've got two batteries, one Dutch battery and an American battery, and they want at least two more and probably three more after that. The Americans are reluctant to commit any more of their own Patriot batteries, but they say there's at least a dozen batteries in Europe. You know, why not some of them? And they put pressure on the Europeans to provide these batteries. There's Patriot batteries in East Asia, in the Gulf, doing nothing in particular. I mean, there's a lot of Patriot batteries around in the world. They're very expensive, about a billion dollars each. There are about 400 million for the battery and all the bits that go with it, and about 600 million for all the ammunition. So they're not cheap, but they'll get in anything. But Patriot batteries are the, the, the A-grade air defence. So the Ukrainians need all sorts of air defence, but they'd love more Patriot batteries, and Zelensky's made that pretty clear. Mm. Now, what about the northeastern front? Reports that some parts of that have fallen to Russia. What yeah, now, th I mean, this is really important, Jane, because when you see these maps, uh, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense until you put the water on them. Have a look at the Sveskyu Donetsk River and the Great Reservoir, the uh, Pishny Res Reservoir, right at the bottom of the river, though, at the southern part of the river. And it begins to make a bit more sense. I mean, the Russians, are I think, are trying to do two quite different things here. They've not committed all that many forces to this operation, though they've got quite a lot of forces around the whole front. But they look as if they're trying to push towards Lipsy. Um, Kharkiv is the second city. They almost certainly can't take Kharkiv with the forces they've got. But if they get to Lipsy, then it's within artillery range. And so they can do what they do best, which is using artillery to just reduce a civilian area to rubble. And then they move in and plant their flag on the rubble. That's the, the one thing the Russians have proved to be really good at. And if they get to Lipsy, they could do that, bring it within conventional artillery range. And the Ukrainians will have to try to stop that happening because that will be, from their point of view, intolerable. But this is the more interesting one. And, and in a way, Lipsy, if they can get to there, is designed to pin Ukrainian forces in place, to make Ukrainians have to defend it, to pin them there so they Break, can't go anywhere breaking else. Their, breaking the line almost. Exactly. Because here is where I think they've got something more ambitious planned, at Vovchansk. And the point is, Vovchansk is the other side of the Sversk Donetsk River. And the Russians have been attacking the bridges. Now, if they wanted to actually swing towards Kharkiv, they'd leave the bridges where they were. But they're not. They're dropping them. Why? Because they're going to go the other way. If they can get Vovchansk, and they haven't yet, then they don't want the Ukrainians coming over the bridges after them. And so I think they'll, they'll swing the other way. I mean, this is what they would like to try to do. Why would they do that? Because off the map here, at Kupiansk, they're putting U Ukrainian forces under great pressure, Kupiansk and Lyman. If they can break through there and link up between Vovchansk and Kupiansk, they then, then they've got themselves area. a belt. And then where do they go? They go, if they can, they then go southwards towards the Donbass, 
from Kharkiv. This is the area that they lost last year, remember, and then northwards from Chazivyar, where they're fighting very hard to link up. Now, that would be a very ambitious campaign plan, but if I was a member of the general staff in Moscow looking at this, I'd say that's what we ought to try to do. If we can stretch the Ukrainians so far that they can't stop us, then we can start to move in the way that we always wanted to move as a proper manoeuvre army. Now, I think that this is too ambitious. I don't think they'll be able to do it. But if they were a proper manoeuvre army, if they can get themselves into gear, and if the Ukrainians cannot stop them and get pinned to the west of that with too many troops trying to defend Kharkiv, then that's a, a plausible outcome. So I think the Vovchansk operation is to operate at the other side of the river, not to try to cross the river, having dropped all the bridges. Really interesting, Michael. I hope they're not watching <laughs> Russia. Thanks very much. Really They'll have worked it out. They'll have worked it out themselves, yeah. Thank you.